Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I share my screen again, I just want to know if uh, I'm audible. If I can just get a thumbs up or something there, or a yes, or a something. I know you can't open your microphones. Just want to check. Thank you, Selma. <laughs> Fantastic. Cool. Then I'll share my screen again. I think we can start. Uh, it's one minute two. Uh, the time. Let me just get this going. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm not going to show you my real face. Uh, that is my Bitmoji on the screen, and we'll talk about Bitmoji again uh, as well today. Um, I have two screens running up. Uh, it's, it's my first time doing two screens because I don't have support on the chat today. It's just me all by my lonesome. So. Unfortunately, you can't open your microphones, but it's fine. I have a chat open to the side. Uh, I won't be able to check it too often, but if you do have a question or if I'm going too fast, please feel free to pop a question in there or a comment or something. We're not a lot of people, so I'm. it's such a cool position to be in to actually be able to help you. So my name is Andrea. I am a dramatic arts and a creative arts teacher at Stellenbosch High. And as I'm talking, as I'm going to go through this today, you're going to actually start thinking that I'm working for Google or they are paying me because, <laughs> because I get incredibly excited about uh, using Google Slides, using the G Suite platform. And this, I prepared this training last year for Flipped Classroom and I never got to present it. But through the training, I, I started using it in my own class because I did a version of it. But I ended up sort of substituting, uh, just just an, in, uh, what do you call it, enhancing. I might flip between Afrikaans and English. I apologize for that, the brain. Um, so I ended up not utilizing the way it should be utilized. But through the training and through going what is possible with Google Slides, I want to say so much of my pedagogy has changed in the last year. So... No, I'm not being paid by Google. I'm just very excited and very passionate about using this to enhance our teaching and to speak to learners that are of, as we know, a very, very different generation to our own. Um, yeah. So, all good, ready to go. Fantastic. So, what is a flipped classroom? No, it's not a classroom that's upside down. I wish that would be very interesting. So I think it's safe to assume that most of us grew up in a classroom that was very teacher-centered. The teacher acted as the Google machine. It gave us information. And um, thank you, Yaku. I saw your comment there. I don't know if it's good luck to me or to the participants, but shop or take. Um, so the teacher ended up being the Google machine, the, the authoritative, authoritative figure, the, the person who knows everything, and the, 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 the pupils, the learners sat there and wanted to, you know, gain knowledge, gain insight, whatever. And then we went into our teaching practice, I think, again, safe to assume that I think most of us went into our teaching practice sort of doing the same thing, even though we didn't want to be the boring teacher with the what was that, the, the tri projector, the transparency thing, um, we still ended up being maybe a version of that. And the time has come, and I want to sort of thank COVID in that way, that we were shoved into a direction, we were pushed to, to reassess the way that we teach, the way that we use technology. Um, and I'm, I'm quite grateful for that because I'm wondering how long it would have taken to actually get there. So it has forced us to reinvestigate what technology can, can bring to the classroom and sort of do away with that teacher-centered uh, notion that we, that we have, that conventional way of teaching. And we, we really try and focus on creating a learner-centered environment, a constructivist, big word, centered environment where learners get the opportunity to, to um, what do you call it, to... to create their own knowledge, to experience differentiated learning, and to really, and for us to allow them to use their different learning styles. So, I did not make this presentation, but that is quite funny, the flipped classroom idea. So, again, 
how do we move away from that teacher-centered environment into a more learner-centered environment? We cannot think for a second that in this 21st century, we can give learners knowledge that they cannot find by themselves on the internet. We need to be able to facilitate digital literacy for the 21st century where we help our learners to know where to find content, how to find it, what to look for, and then also assess what is valid content. You know, this, this hot term called fake news and everything. They're going into a world where we are actually not needed in the conventional way that we were taught to teach. We are needed to facilitate a learning experience, but to help them to learn for themselves. If that makes, I hope that somehow makes sense. And what we what we gathered from the whole COVID what we call it, era uh, is that learners are not yet really ready to work autonomously um, and to to have that discipline to engage with work at home and then come to class. So what a flipped classroom idea can help us with is to condition them to be able to learn by themselves, to engage with content and then come to class and then consolidate that learning. So conventionally, we would teach in class, we would give the content, they would go home, they would do the homework, and they would come back to class and we go on with the rest of the work. So with Flip Classroom, we give them the content to go through at home, they come to class, and then we consolidate the learning by really engaging with them, because now they know what we're talking about. So as we go through this session today, hopefully this would make a little bit more sense, because what we really want to actually move towards is more of a blended learning concept. So that is where we used a flipped classroom approach, but we also integrated into our teaching the next day. So if we create a Google Slides presentation, um, not receiving any interaction or sound. Uh, Raquel, I, heard, I don't know if that I'm pronouncing it correctly. Is anyone else having difficulty with sound? I'd appreciate it. If you can just pop me a message there in the chat. I'll continue talking for now because maybe it's just her sound. I'm not quite sure. Um, so if we create a Google Slides. Oh, thank you, Monique. Oof, um, let me just, I'm just going to respond here to Raquel quickly. I'm not a very fast typer though. Uh, just give me a second. This computer. Oh, there might be typos in there. Okay. Okay. So with, we're creating a Google Slides presentation and it's a lot of work. I'm not going to lie to you. It's a lot of work to get this going and to make it visually appealing to the learners. But we can, we don't have to make two separate things. So we can use this flipped classroom Google Slides presentation that we created, and we can sort of, we can adapt it for our class practice. So what I've ended up doing, and <laughs> we all have to do this horrible, boring lesson planning thing, ugh, um, is my slides, my flipped classroom presentations have become my lesson plans. So it's pretty much like creative arts, I teach once a week, but I teach it five times. Uh, so I open up the presentation, I go through the slides and I know exactly what I'm doing. Um, I don't have to reinvent my lessons every single time. So it, it, if you create these things once, yes, it's going to take a lot of time, but then you can use them again and again and again. And once you get bored or the learners get bored or whatever, you can just change it a little bit or a lot. It doesn't really matter. So blended learning is this idea of a person-to-person, -person, a face-to-face -face teaching mixed, blended with an online platform with digital pedagog pedagogy. Why am I struggling with that word? Um, so that we can create this, uh, what do you call it, like a um, uh, comprehensive, uh, all-inclusive learning opportunity, learning environment. So hopefully, I'm not going to talk too long about the theory because what you've experienced, hopefully you got the email, is you would have uh, received an email with a presentation in it, with some theory in it. 
and the ideas then that you would have gone through the theory and then we just consolidate that and get to the fun bits which is the practical stuff i'm literally clapping my hands here as, we, as i'm just speaking um, and we get to the practical stuff because that's why you're here we don't want to sit and listen to theory the whole day so if you haven't managed to go through that theoretical sounds so horrible i need to find a different word it sounds so like class for me if you haven't gone through the info the content and the email please do so uh a, by yourself this evening grab a you know, glass of juice or wine or something and then go through that and hopefully a lot of these things will make a little bit more sense so i'm not going to spend a lot of time in theory i really want to actually wrap up the theory in about 10 minutes and then we're going to get to the practical and i'll give you like a two or three minute just a quick stand up uh, break just to get the blood flowing again so why are we using google slides excuse me just a bit of water so I can't really speak for PowerPoint and Microsoft because I'm a Google baby. Uh, I'm sure Microsoft has an online platform as well, but I don't know it. So Google Slides for me is like com computer technology interfacing for mm -hmm, dummies because it's so simple. Uh, I don't see myself as a dummy, but it's a, it's, a, it's a simple platform to use. It's very intuitive and it's big and bold and colorful. And also it's very data friendly for our learners. I suppose for ourselves as well. You have this online access. Um, thank you, Lionel. So um, you have this online access from Google Slides, which means it's cloud-based and you as a teacher can alter it any time, even if you post it to classroom, but also the learners are able to access it anywhere because remember most of our learners are accessing it probably from a mobile device. So we want to make it accessible for that specific device. Uh, yes, they're gonna use desktops as well, but we need to design these things just Keep that in mind that they might be using mobile data and they might be using a smaller screen than a desktop. You can also publish online. We will get to that a bit, little bit later. And I also have a brand new option that I found about, I think, two days ago, which is very exciting. So that if you publish online, it becomes like a mini website. You've actually created this tiny little website and your learners can access it without going to the, you'll see on the Google Slides, there's a slideshow button without seeing all of that. They literally just open it and it looks like a website. It's mobile friendly, like I said, and it's also easy to add the self-navigating tools. This is what I'm talking about. It's a little bit sort of presentation for dummies because it's so intuitive. It's so user-friendly. You don't have to go and find like a whole bunch of different shortcuts and things. And we'll get to all of those practical things in a little bit. So what we'll look at today, we'll look at the self-navigating slide. I'll show you this as an example. This is the one I'm using, actually. This is also the one that was emailed to you. So you will be able to peruse that in your free time as well. We'll look at some practical examples. That's the fun bit. You'll get an, uh, a chance to practice. And I will stay online because this training session ends at half past four, but I will be available afterwards as well. If you have some questions or you just want to have a little chat or share something with me, because that's the other fun part about presenting this training is I learn something new every single time. It's so cool. And then at the end, I'm not going to use the swear word, the homework word. It's not that. It's the idea that the template that I'm going to share with you, it has some prompts, some instructions. And we would like for you to actually play around with it, maybe create something that you can use in your classroom and then submit it. And I would love to give you some feedback on that. Trust me, it's not going to take you a long time. It's just a bit of practice. It's very simple because once you get the hang of this, yes, the first or the second or the third time might be a bit intimidating. But once you get the hang of it, it's like, you know, it's so quick. So the submission of evidence is sort of this first step of just trying to uh, navigate your way through this platform. And I think I will just confirm by the end of the session uh, that the evidence, what's today, Wednesday, needs to be in in a week. But I will, I think Yaku, my e learning advisor, will send everyone an email who joined today just with the details on that. 
While we're on some admin, by the way, just remember to sign or to do what do you call it? The, the attendance register. Just fill that in. I've posted it in the chat. I'll quickly post it again. Uh, please be sure to use this one. Apparently, there's another one. Yaku used big words that I can't remember now. If you have another one somewhere, don't use the other one. Use this one, <laughs> the special one that I've, that I've posted now into the chat. I hope you can find it there. Okay, so this presentation that you receive via email is such a cool uh, example of a flipped classroom. It's We have a lot of white space, which is, it makes it very readable and digestible. It has color and it has a very clear navigational guide. So this down here, the navigation icons at the bottom, this is something very important for your learners as well because they they need to be trained how to, to use this flipped classroom concept. We can't just throw this at them and expect them to know what to do because I don't know how many high school educators we have in primary school. Yeah, a grade 12 kid might be able to navigate their way through it, but the idea is to condition them from a sort of an early age to get used to this idea because remember, now they're used to, you know, getting to work and class and they're sitting there very unengaged and very unenthusiastic. They go home, they do their homework and they come back. We want to flip that. And to flip it, it, it it's not just going to happen overnight. We need time. We need uh, determination and commitment to do this. And by doing something simple, simple and silly, not so many, basic like this, just adding navigational icons, it conditions them to look for certain things with, within the presentation so that they can find their way through the work easily. Because if we change it every time too much, it's going to be, start becoming a bit tricky. So when we go, as you can see, I actually literally just clicked on it. That's so cool. So when you go to design elements, I want to remind you of the people who are sitting in front of us. I know you're going to go, Andrea, shut up. We know. So I looked it up today. They have an attention span of eight seconds. That's the average. Eight seconds. And it's not just teenagers. It's actually adults too. Because they're conditioned to social media and stuff coming at them fast, if they are bored with something, you will lose them literally within eight seconds. So we want to keep our design elements engaging. We want to keep it simple. We, want to, we don't want to overload our slides with too much information. We've all seen those PowerPoints where it's just too much text on, too many images, the colors are clashing, doesn't make any sense. You just have a random picture of a guy on a bike. It, it doesn't make any sense. So we need to know who are we designing this for. And that is very important. So again, you can go through all of these, um, these little tabs. So if you just click on that, it takes you to that information. It's a little animation that pops up. You can read through it. It'll give you an idea of what you can do in Google Slides. And I don't know if you saw that now. I went back to in, uh, index, the top left, and it just takes me back to this. No oh man, takes me back to this index thing here. But we'll get to that with the practical. I'm trying to fly through the theory. So self-navigation, that is one of the most important aspects of a flipped classroom presentation design. You can't just we can't just hoard this information on various slides and not give an opportunity to guide themselves through it. But you need to plan beforehand. Just take a piece of paper and a pen or whatever and draw up what you want in there. So let's say you are, okay, I'm trying to think of a subject I can relate to. You are doing, you're teaching English and you want to go through all the figures of speech. My recommend, recommendation is not to do all of them in one slides presentation because your slides presentation is going to be about 80 slides long. Rather chop it up and do one presentation just for metaphors and similes. And then another one for whatever else figure of speech there is. I can't think of one now. So you chop it up, you make it consumable for them, digestible, something to work with, and that's part of your planning. Then when you have your plan, you can actually start building your presentation. And then at the end, you're going to link all of the slides together and you're going to create this index. Again, I'll show you with the practical example, how do you do that? Because if you start at the end, you go, mm, I'm so excited, I can link things now. You're going to end up actually having to redo it because as you work through your slide presentation, 
things are going to change. It is inevitable. Stuff's going to change. You're going to be very frustrated because then you have to recreate all of the links, but you'll understand a bit more in a bit. I'm going to go back to the index. The third aspect that is actually quite important. Sorry, I'm just taking some water in between. Um, so is the idea of assessment. So we all know CAPS is very demanding with its assessment and everything else. And in between, we need to do some formative assessment as well, just to, to see what our learners are doing and what they understand. And digital assessment makes this so much easier. If you use a platform like Quizzes, Zizzes, I hope you know what I'm talking about. I never know how to pronounce that. Or Kahoot or Google Forms or so many bazillion other digital assessment platforms out there. You literally have it marked instantaneously. You don't have to go home with a red pen. And if you send your learners home to do some content, to go and work through content, and you give them a digital assessment to do at home, you get immediate feedback. They get immediate feedback. And it also adds this, this gamification aspect, which they love. I mean, we love it. So obviously, they're going to love it too. So it gives you this added opportunity to, to use assessment in a different way. Going back to the index, and then the last thing I want to mention, and I think I mentioned it earlier, is the adaptation to a classroom. So as you've seen now, the slides that I've shown you is literally just sort of the cover slide to a specific section. It doesn't go into the section because I am teaching, quote unquote now, with the assumption that you have gone through the content. I'm not going to show that content to my class necessarily again because they're going to end up reading. Um, they're going to end up reading the screen and not listening to what I'm saying. So we want to maybe simplify the presentation a little bit or adjust it a little bit for the classroom. So if you have a digital assessment, maybe adjust it a little bit more for your face-to-face uh, -face classes. Raquel, I see your hand is up, but unfortunately, I don't have access to unmute uh, microphones uh, because I don't work for the CWED. So if you can maybe type out your question, that will be great. And I'll have a looky in a little bit. I hope, I hope that's possible. I'm so sorry. I don't know if she can hear me, actually. Um, I'm going to continue, and I hope that she heard that. It's always so weird presenting because it feel like, feels like you're monologuing to yourself. <laughs> okay, so I have now run through the theory. Literally, I ran through it. And now I want to go to the practical bit. But to do that, I want to share a link with you. Um, I'm going to paste it in the chat. And I'm also going to give you a quick, just like a two-minute, if you just want to get up and stretch your legs, I know we've only been busy for about 25 minutes, but if you need to, you can do that. You can open up this link. It's going to give you a prompt and ask, it's going to ask you to make a copy. So let me just show you here. So it's going to go to this landing page. Just by the way, how you actually, how you can do this is very cool. You, when you copy the, the share link, um, I'm speaking now like I, I'm assuming that you know some basics of Google, uh, Google Slides. Uh, if you don't and you want to recap, there are some videos available on the CWED site that you can just go and recap those basics because I'm not going to go into all of the basic things. This is a summit training session, so we, we sort of believe that you're a, a bit more advanced in your slides. Not a lot, just a little bit more. But if you want to get to this landing page, if you want your learners to make a copy of something or whoever else, all you do is when you copy that, that link, the share link, you take everything behind that last slash, you take it away and you just write copy and it's going to take you to this. So that's how simple it is. So make a copy and this is going to make a copy to your own personal drive. Uh, so I just responded to Raquel there. So it's going to take you to this copy and it's going to land in your drive. And just a note of not caution, but just be advised, be aware that your drive ugh, 
it can get messy in there. So if you have a copy of this thing in your drive now, just make sure to go and have a look at your drive this afternoon and maybe just give it a different title. Otherwise, it's going to end up like my drive looked about a year ago and it was just copy of this, copy of this, copy of this. Just keep it organized so you can find your stuff easily. So just a quick one or two minute break to stretch your legs. Um, I will start again literally at 15, 26, 27. And we will get into the practical stuff. If you want, if you have some questions, uh, pop them in the chat and I will have a look at them. Cool. Okay, that was a very quick break. Um, just to remind you again, please sign that attendance register. And now I'm annoying about that, <clears throat> but I am a teacher, so I need to be annoying sometimes. So can I just see a, just raise your hands if you're still with me, if I haven't bored you to death, still alive out there. Hey, thank you, Nicolette. Thank you, Monique. <laughs> Thank you very much, people. Okay, great. Ah, oh, we have some life. Fantastic. You can lower your hands again. Thank you. Lekker, lekker. All right. So, to start off with, we want to change the title. <laughs> Slight thing. So, let's just go for example. What's today? The 11th of May, 2022. Cool. So, that's going to be the name of my, the title of my slides. Just for today. And this is the template that I, that I told you about that we would like you to submit for, for evidence of, of hmm, evidence of learning. Um, so and on all these slides, you have some prompts, some instructions, and we're going to work through it bit by bit. So you're not going to have to do this by yourself. And I will give you a little bit of time in between to just work with it. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. I cannot guarantee that I will be able to answer them. But uh, challenge me. That's it's lucky that 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 prompts me to go and learn something new, which is great. So replace this title with your name. Okay, I got married recently, so I need to remember to type my new surname. Okay, so that's going to be, and obviously you can change this with whatever font. You, I'm not a big fan of Arial. It's just so boring. So let's go for something else. Let's go for this. Ooh, that's a nice one. And you can shift it to the middle, whatever you want to. Again, these are all sort of basics for Google Slides. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of the functionality and formatting options. 
but just know that you can play around. Okay, and next up, it's to apply a theme. So Google Slides, it has a bank of uh, some themes that we can use. They're all incredibly boring, but we're going to use the boring one for now because a little bit later, I'm going to show you a very cool website that you can use to really vamp up your, your slides presentations. So I'm going to use this boring old one just to show you how it affects you. See, it's, it's changed the font. Yo, you can barely see that now, but I'm going to use this for now. Uh, it changes the font uh, and just the vibe, the whole feel to it. So if I choose that one, it's going to make it, uh, it's going to make it ugly throughout. Let's just use that boring one just to show you. Okay. So if you import a theme, cause you have that option down there, you can import a theme uh, here at the bottom, right? But if you import it and you, you sort of paste it over the stuff that you have, the template that you have, it can throw out a lot of things. So my, my suggestion is that if you want to use a different theme, use it from scratch. So we're not going to use it for this template for this exercise today. Uh, but when you create your own stuff, go to the, the website that I'm going to post later with all of the slides templates. They're free. You can use them. You just have to give them credit. So at the bottom here, you see presentation powered by slides go. We're not going to use slides, guys. I'm going to delete that. And flat icon, which we will get to. We will use that. We need to start programming ourselves to give recognition where it is due. Uh, I'm still in the process of training myself. I'm not doing that as, um, as much as I should. But just to show you, this is an example of something that I did for matric class. A beautiful, I think it's stunning, the, the template. It's really pretty. But... I used it from scratch. So I didn't create all of my content first and then just pasted the template over it. I used it from scratch. And this is just another example. I love this template because all of these elements, you can change the color, you can change the color and the size. And this is my index. So all of my stuff is in Afrikaans. Uh, but it, it just gives such a lack of vibe to it instead of this ugly old thing that we're using today. But it's fine for now. It's just to show you as an example. So we've added our theme. And then the next thing, our next instruction is optional, add a Bitmoji. <clears throat> it's not optional. Bitmoji is so much fun. I know it's cliche. <laughs> and I think we give away our age when we use Bitmoji, but I love it so much. Obviously, you can be a bit more narcissistic and a picture of yourself on the screen. <laughs> but Bitmoji, it's fun. It's it's personalizing a little bit because ultimately we still want our learners to know that there's a human being behind their class, behind this content. It's not just cold words on a screen, you know? So if you haven't installed Bitmoji yet, it's a bit of a process because as far as I understand, because I did it on my phone, you have to download the app on your phone. You create this avatar. You can really personalize every single way, <clears throat> give yourself pink hair and, you know, small eyes or whatever you want to. And then you add the extension. So if you click this link right there, it's going to take you to the Chrome store and it's going to lead, it's going to install a, what do you call it? A add on extension to your Chrome browser. And it's going to be right there. So now my Bitmoji is already set up. This is something you can go explore by yourself as well. YouTube has a lot of, uh, resources for how to use Bitmoji. It's super simple. So I have now just gone to my, it's right here. So if I've pinned it to that bar, it'll usually be in that little drop down with the puzzle piece, but I've pinned it up there. As you can see there, Bitmoji, it has a little pin. So I have easy access to it because I use it a lot. I change my outfits like every week. I spend way too much time on this app. So let's say it is Christmas. Can I just type properly, please? It's, <laughs> it's Christmas and I want to use this one. So it's very easy. You click on it and you just drag it and it's going to pop into your presentation. Now, let me just make a little note on this. When you use images, in your slides. Again, we, we're competing with Instagram and with TikTok and all sorts of incredible visual platforms. Please do not take your image and go, oh, it doesn't fit in there. I want to make it bigger. Now you're going to, okay, that, that goes fine. Please do not do 
that. It's so ugly and no one can look at it. Use the original size, the original dimensions. Once I've stretched it and I want to just get it back, it's going to give you this diagonal line across the screen. There you go. And now I know it's the right size again. So if you want to resize, grab the corner um, like that. Sorry, I'm using a Chromebook and the touchpad is not very sensitive. So I have to press very hard. And you can just uh, hoi it around on the screen. You can change it. You can uh, put it wherever you want to. So that's the basic principle of it. So Bitmoji makes it fun, makes it a little bit more personalized. It makes it more interactive. And my hairstyle changes a lot. So you can go into the app. You can change your hairstyle uh, and whatever you want to. So I hope that makes sense. Please let me know on the chat if I am going too fast. I know I have a tendency to talk very fast. I'm just very excited about getting to the stuff. Oh, I'm such a nerd sometimes. Okay, so on our next slide, so this is slide number two. This would be your index usually. So this is going to show your users, the participants, the learners, how to use the presentation that you have created. So as I've said with the little theory bit at the beginning, you don't necessarily want to link all of these things right at the beginning of your presentation uh, creation. Uh, Johanna, I'm going to just copy and paste the link. No, it's not that one. Uh, I just want to paste the attendance register again. Ooh, ooh, no, that made a very long thing. I'm sorry. I've just pasted a lot of things that I shouldn't have. There you go. It's very weird navigating two screens at the same time. It feels very sort of hackerish IT movie thing. <laughs> okay. So you don't want to go and link all of these things at the beginning because your, your planning might change, your presentation might change, and then you have to go and relink everything at the end. And it's just a waste of time. So for today, I'm going to link it now just to show you how to do it. But really, as a suggestion, try and keep this part of the plan to the end of creating your presentation. So we can do in-text uh, linking or text linking. Basically, this is a text box, I think, as you know. And you can just highlight whatever you want to link. And then you can right click. And it will give you this option to link. I hope you can see that. My other screen is lagging a little bit. So you highlight the text, right click, link. So you can you can now link, you can now link that text to an external source, to Wikipedia or whatever, but we want to link this to another slide. That's what makes this classroom so cool. But we don't want to say next slide because we might want to actually put content in between this slide and the next slide for some reason. So we're going to look for slides in this presentation. So it's that bottom option. And here at the bottom, you'll see slide three is page one. And that is actually what we're looking for because slide three right there, that is uh, page one. So you link it to that. So now when you click on it, it's going to go to this slide. The next link is going to be item two. You highlight it, right click, you click link. But now what is annoying, and I really do hope Google fixes this very soon, is if your, your objects, your things on your slide is too low on the screen, can you see what happens if I right click link? I can't actually, I can't see slides in this presentation, that option right there. So what, what I just do is you move your thing so you can allow the drop down box to become completely visible. So highlight, right click, link. It's just an annoying little thing, but you get used to it. So slides in this presentation and we want to go to page two. We'll highlight this one and this one is going to page three. So right click, link, slides in this presentation. Scroll down page three. So all of those things are now linked. I'm not going to move my box just yet. Slide link, please. Are you talking about the, the, the template that you're using? I will just copy and paste that for you. Um, here we go. 
I hope that's what you were referring to, Ingela. Cool. So the last thing we want to uh, link to is the assessment. So highlight, right click, link. It's down there, slides in this presentation. You can also search for a specific slide if you know what the title is. So I'm just going to do that for now because it's obviously called assessment. So I can search for assessment. And we go slide six, add external assessment to your slide. Boom. And we just move that back so it looks a bit better. So when you want to insert, pleasure, Ingela, no problem. Um, when you want to insert more slides into your presentation, yeah, you can click on that and you can just hit enter and it'll give you another slide. But that's not the best thing to do because as you've seen now, when you want to link things, uh, that, that drop-down box will only pick up the titles of your slides. So you want to use this option here at the top that says the little plus sign, use the drop down next to it, and you go to something that's that actually has a title in it. So title and body or title and two columns, title only, and those things, if you then type the title into that, onto that slide, it's going to pop up in that drop down box so it's easier to link. I hope that makes that makes sense. So you know, if I want to use title only because it's going to be image slide or whatever, if I type something in there, that's going to appear in the drop down box when I want to link it. But I'm not going to go into that example now. I just want to delete that one. So the next bit we want to look at is flat icon. Flat icon is one of the coolest extensions or add ons. So you're going to find add ons there in the world. And I'm probably overselling it, but I think it is so cool. And the amount of free stuff that you get on there, obviously, like everything else, you can you can get a paid version, but ah, why bother? It's giving you amazing things for free. So if you haven't uh, installed Flat Icon ever, uh, you can just click on this link, and it'll take you to the Chrome store. Again, it's going to take you through some steps to install it. So I'm going to actually allow you to do that uh, if you can. Just click on the link go to, it's going to open up a thing in Chrome. So obviously I'm, I'm not going to be able to show you the steps now because I already have it installed. So it's going to open this up. It's going to say install now. And if it asks you for which account, I think it gives you a prompt of what account that you want to use. Just use your Google account. It's just easy if it's linked to your slides thing. You don't have to create a separate account for that. So if you want to do that quickly, it's not too complicated, I think. I tried it this morning just, uh, from a different browser, and it didn't seem too complicated. I've just been using it so much because I really enjoy it. Okay, I'm going to continue with my monologue on this side uh, while you're going about that. To open up Flat Icon once it's been installed, it's not going to pop up there. It's not going to be in your Chrome browser, the little tray at the top. It's going to be in your, your app, your G Suite Google app. So whether it be Google Docs or Google Slides or whatever, it's going to be at the add-ons. You're going to click on that, and it doesn't have the name Flat Icon. I don't know why, but it's called Icons for Slides and Docs. So you just go to that, Icons for Slides and Docs, and you say Start. And it's going to open up this dialog <clears throat> to your right, on the right-hand side of your screen. And it's going to ask you to sign in. <clears throat> if you're not signed in, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> if you're not signed in, it's going to give you like max five a day. So just use your Google account, Google, your Google account, and it's going to give you <laughs> like a bazillion free ones a day. So you don't necessarily have to do that now. I just want to demonstrate how to use it. Oh, hello, Yaku. Thank you. Okay. So let me just do that again from scratch. So add-ons, icons for slides and docs. And you say start. And sometimes it kicks you out. I don't know why. It's like a, a, a uncle that doesn't like you very much and it just kicks you out. You just close it and you open it up again or you refresh your, your, your browser, your tab. So for this index slide, we want to now, I don't know if you remember in the theory part of this, uh, we had some arrows and there was a little icon that, that indicated what an index, where the index is. 
So we want to now find something like an arrow to add to this back and next and then the index. And flat icon, it's a, what do you call it? It doesn't have a background. So it's like a PNG-ish sort of thing. Uh, so you can you can do with it whatever you want. It doesn't have this white space around it and you now have to fit it in somewhere. So let's look for an arrow. So you just type in the search bar here at the top. It's going to give you a whole bunch of different arrows. <laughs> so cool. Um, I don't know what I feel like today. Let's go for, I'm going to be boring. I'm going to use this one. You can be the exciting people and you can use different arrows. I'm going to use this one. You can change the color as well. So maybe I want a red. Okay. Let's go for purple. Yeah, I like purple. And you can change the size as well. So how many pixels you want it to be. I'm not going to use a massive arrow, so I might as well just change the pixels, but like, let's go for 64. And you just click insert, and it's going to go it there to your top left. I think that's sort of the default position. And there we have our arrow. Now you can go in and you can choose a different arrow if you want to, for because now we have a, a next arrow, right? So that's going to be, it's going to be that one. But we also want an arrow for the back. So you can go in and you can choose a different one. Basically, if you search for something in flat icon, it's going to give you a whole sticker pack that, that relates to the one that you chose. So it's going to be the same style. I don't know if you picked that up. It, it, they all look somewhat similar to this arrow. So it already, you have this uh, continuity in your presentation that it looks the same. Winning at life. But I'm not going to choose a different arrow. I'm just going to show you what, what I can do. So I can use that arrow, copy and paste it, um, go there to format options and size and rotation. Again, these are some of the Google Slides basics, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. You can just see what I'm doing. And I'm going to say flip. It's going to go to the other side. And now I have two arrows, one for next and one for back. Let me just do it that way. Okay. Now we want an index one. So Actually, ooh, I don't even have to search for index. I have one right here that looks a little bit like an index. Let's make this one blue. Why not? It's still 64 pixels. Insert. And there we have the index one. So you can obviously resize this to whatever you want. I'm going to keep it sort of that size. And now we want to go and link all of these different components to the other slides. But as I click this, I don't know if you saw, it becomes quite annoying if your text boxes are too big because then it becomes tricky to click on these individual smaller elements. So my suggestion is really narrow down your text boxes as much as you can. I'm going to make this one smaller because if you can see, this one crosses the path of my arrows and it becomes really annoying when I want to select things. That might be a bit pedantic and a bit extra, but that's what I prefer. Because so, now, if I drag, I'm just selecting those three elements on the page. And now I can move them. Whereas if the text box is interfered, I can't really do that and it becomes annoying. So, I'm going to move these guys over here in a little bit. I just want to link them first. And like I said in the previous slide, it becomes annoying, or this slide just a little bit earlier, it becomes annoying at that dialogue, the drop down box cuts off at the end. So I'm going to keep them up here. So with images, it's not the same as with text. Uh, with text, you're going to right click and there's going to be a link option. But with images, for some reason, it doesn't give you that option. So with images, you just you choose the image, you click on it. And then there's this hyperlink uh, here at the top tray. I don't know if I'm using the right words for this, but the link option is right there. You click on that, and now it gives you the same thing as you had with your text. It's just in two different places with text. It's going to be right-click, link, and with an image, it's going to be here at the top. So we're going to choose the slides in this presentation. We're going to use previous slide because we want to go back. This one and the link thing up there. We're going to go to the next slide. And then this one, we want it to link to the index, but this is the index one. I'll just do it anyway. 
slides in this presentation. So it's silly to have a link on a, on a slide that you're already on, but you'll see what I'm gonna do in just a second. So now you have everything linked. So what we wanna do is we wanna move it back down there so that all these things line up. Now we know that this is the back button, this is the next button, and this is the index button. But I wanna do something else before I finalize that actually. Um, I'm just gonna copy these so I have an extra pair. No, don't do that. Mm -mm. It's a bit finicky sometimes picking it up and this Chromebook is really annoying. I do not recommend buying a Chromebook. So we have our icons there and all these ones are actually already linked, right? Because I copy and pasted them. I just have an, an extra set now. But what we want is we want these navigational little icons on every single slide. So if I go to that one or this one, I can click on, click on the purple arrows or the blue index and it will take me to wherever I want to be. So my suggestion is to put it at the bottom right-hand corner just because I find that's, that's sort of the logical place for me. But another logical place would be top right-hand corner. Uh, apparently, you should not put them at the bottom left. So don't put them down here uh, because when you access the mobile version of the slides, there's something that pops up there and that makes the navigation tricky because you can't see the buttons. I've never tried it, but that's what I heard. So do not put them down here in the left-hand corner rather in the right-hand corner. I'm just going to make them a bit smaller. So again, I select all of them. And when you select all of them, you can resize them at the same time, which is pretty cool. And I'm going to drag them down here. Just align them. You'll see these red navigational lines, which are really cool, because then you have everything sort of matching up. So it's not wonky and all over the place. So now we have that at the bottom there, but why on earth would I have done that? Because now you can cut and you're going to paste it on every single slide because if you paste it there, it's already linked. Oh, and that link, sometimes it does this as well. The link makes, it goes weird, but I'll change it quickly. Uh-uh. Let me just fix this. I want to fix that too. I have no idea why it does that. It's done that to me before, but then you just fix it once and then it's fixed. Go up. So I'm going to mm, just drag it all the way up here. Ah, okay. Now, man. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Andrea, sorry, it's a four o'clock, three o'clock brain going on here. Boom, now <laughs> I can use it. I'm going to unlink it and relink it to the index page. Index. That is still previous slide. That is still next slide. So we're good to go. I'm going to move it down here. Go. Uh -uh. Now let's try it again. So I'm going to go copy. So I've just clicked Control C to copy. And when you paste, it's going to paste in exactly the same spot that you copied it from. So it's still going to be down there, which is great. You don't have to move it every time. And there we go. So that, that is the correct link. If I open it up, it is slide to the index. Yay. So I suggest that you just check it before you go and copy and paste on 40 different slides. Just check that it is linked correctly because now I can go paste. Next one, paste, and they are all linked. Ha -ha. And that is the beginning of a self-navigating slide. Cool, eh? Okay, so is everyone still with me? We have about 35 minutes left of the practical stuff that I want to show you, and then you can ask your questions. But is there anything that, that anyone is stuck with now? Yaku, are you, are you here, here, or are you just checking in? I suppose you just checked in. That's fine. We will continue then. <clears throat> okay, so on page one, slide three, it asks us to add some text. So, yeah, I can go and here is some text. I can do that. 
Or maybe you have some notes that you want to use and now you just don't want to go and retype everything and you can just copy and paste it, yeah? But what's cool with Slide is I have this one prepared. Again, I apologize for it being in um, Afrikaans. So that's one little script. Um, I'm going to paste it there. So I can just hit paste, right? And it's going to give me exactly the same format that I used in my original document that I got it from. Or I can right click and say paste without formatting. So it's automatically going to assume it's going to adjust to the, the font, your default font in your slides presentation. So if you used a template like this one with a weirdish font, it's going to copy it in that font. So you don't have to go and readjust every single thing. So I think that's a pretty cool trick and it saved me a lot of time. And now we want to maybe add a flat icon here. This is, I think this is obviously too much text, by the way, just as a suggestion when you're creating your stuff. If the font is too small, too much text. I would, if this was actually something I had to put on my, on my slide, I would just make it much bigger and more. It's going to read much easier if I just make it bigger. It's pretty much going to take up the whole slide. And doesn't want to go bigger because my box is full. That's fine. I'm going to take this out. It wants us to add a flat icon to add some value to the text. We know that we get bored if we look at a slide that is just this, right? It's white. There's some black text on it. Blah. So we want to maybe add some images that's going to, well, it's, it has to enrich the learning experience. It has to support what you are actually trying to communicate. Don't just add a random picture of a sun just because it's pretty. Add something that adds value. So this little extract is about breathing. So maybe I want to go just fine. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. I'm going to I'm going to make this text box smaller again. Annoying. Okay. So add-ons, icons for slides and docs. We're going to start. It's going to open this dialogue to the right again. And let's search for, um, um, it's about breathing, so let's search for mouth. Maybe that could be interesting. Yep, yep. Ooh, okay. Ooh, ooh, that's pretty. I haven't seen that one before. Okay, let's go for that one. And I'll use a, yeah, actually, no, I'll stick with the big one. I can just resize it if I want to. The amount of pixels just allows you to make it a bit bigger if you want to, but now it's not fitting in, so I'm going to reshape the text box, put it there, just make this a bit smaller. So you play around and still it starts looking like something that you can actually look at. I still don't think it's pretty enough, but we're just going through examples. I need to leave my issues behind because I will spend hours and hours and hours on making something look pretty. I have this theory, if you do this right the first time, if you create a, a flip classroom presentation once, you can use it again and again and again. So you might as well put in the effort once and just get it done right. So on the next slide, uh, page two, it instructs us to, the prompt says we have to insert an image, try to use an image from an add-on. Yes, you can use something like Unsplash. Uh, that is what I've been told to sort of introduce you to, but I never found Unsplash to be that amazing. Uh, regular Google image search is great. Uh, and that is just what I'm going to do here. Oh, this text box is annoying. Let me just show you something, by the way, while I'm on this idea of a text box. So I'm going to just move this. So a text box is a text box is a text box. It's always going to be the same shape. It's going to be this rectangular thing or a square thing. You can literally use a shape as a text box as well. And what the cool thing is, if you insert a, sh insert, <clears throat> sure. insert a shape, you can, you can change it if you get bored of it. So you can adjust it. You can never change the shape, tongue twister, you can never change the shape of a text box. So I'm going to show you insert shape. And let's go for this one. 
And it's going to give you this default fill. It's really ugly. But let's just keep like that, like, okay, well, now let's change it. I can't look at it. So let's just go for a pink. And you can change the border color as well by going to, to up there. Let's just go for that one. Okay, so now we have a different shape for a text box. Let's say I'm actually getting bored of the shape and it doesn't work with my presentation anymore. You right click and you say change shape and you can change it to another shape. And you can still use it as text box because you click in there and you can type. So it operates exactly the same way. It's just not as annoying as a text box. So I'm going to copy this text and insert it in there. Right click, based without formatting. I'm going to delete this text box. Here you go. It looks a bit better, I think. So we, okay, so back to the images. In certain image, try to use an image from an add-on. I am regarding Google as my add-on here. So insert image, search the web. So this is gonna open a browser here to your right. And all of these images are copyright free and they're sort of safe. So you're not gonna find dodgy things on there. And let's say we're going to stick with the, the concept of, of breathing. That's what I'm teaching in this thing. So, uh, uh, oof, lungs are going to be a weird one. So let's go for breath and see what it gives us. Oh, okay. that's a gross one. Let's go for this one. So you basically just click and you say insert. And you can adjust this image. Again, please don't stretch an image by doing that because it distorts the whole thing and it, it, it makes it ugly. If, you're, if your image is not fitting in with your presentation or it's too big or you want to actually want to try and squeeze it in some way, rather go for the crop option and that's very simple to do. You click on, so you double click on your image and it's going to give you this crop option right there. It's going to make these little black it's going to give you black markers on the image itself. And then you can crop accordingly. So I'm going to just cut that away. So it's not reshaping your image. It's making it a bit smaller and it's, it's doing away with some of the background. Your image still stays the way it should be. And if I want to finalize that crop, I can just enter. You just click enter. The image is a different size. It might fit in somewhere a little bit better. Let me just switch that. And what's also pretty cool, just don't overuse this because it can maybe become quite weird, I think, is you can mask an image. So I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger for you to see. So if you, it's basically you put a mask on top of your image, so it changes the shape of the image. Here next to the crop option that I just showed you, there's a drop-down box. You click on the drop-down, and just to demonstrate this, maybe not the best... Um, example but i'll show you i want to use an arrow <laughs> so your image is now masked by an arrow so it becomes this weird little image but it's that one specifically is ugly so i can't look at it but that's the idea so if you want to mask your image let's rather go for a circle so shape i'll go for a circle that's a little bit better yeah okay it looks a little bit better than the weird arrow so I'm not going to go into this because I still have a few things to go through. We might get back to it, but you can add an image to the background of a slide as well. Uh, just make sure that your image is at the back because let's say I do this. We have something called layers in visuals. So this is now the top layer and that is the back layer. But let's say I want to put this behind the text. You, you right click on it and you say order. So it's sent backwards and there. Now it's behind it. And if you want to bring it forward again, you right click on it, you say order, bring forward. So sometimes you have like three or four different, oh, 10 things, different things going on in your presentation that are all sort of on top of each other. And you just keep on going, right click, bring forward, bring forward, bring forward. Sometimes it takes a few times to get there. So that's just a little trick there. Okay. So. We can't just create this text on a slide and think it's going to be interesting enough. 
to retain the information, ach, the, the retention, the eight second attention span. We need to really go into and indulge in this idea of other um, modes, other mediums. So not just videos. Yes, videos, great, fantastic, use them. But also voiceovers. You can use a voice note to just to explain something on a slide, which for me is great because sometimes I do, I go through my question papers. So the kids have now written a test. They get their tests back. And I don't necessarily want to spend class time on it. So I create this PowerPoint after the Google Slides presentation. And I, I add the memo and bits of the memo on every slide. And then I add a little voice note to it that just explains it a bit better. And also it adds that factor of just humanity, just being as a human being behind your, your slides presentation. It's not just the cold, there's your content. Uh, and sometimes I think if my learners hear my voice, they are more <laughs> encouraged to work. Well, that's what I believe. So there was a cool add-on that you could use. It's called Moat. It's this little pink, a uh, little purple thing. But Yaku and I have discussed this. It's not that good anymore because now it wants you to pay everything. So I'm just going to show you a different route that you can follow. I have not found a good go, uh, Chrome extension that is free. So it is a bit of a route, but it's okay to do it. If you want to insert an audio, you can't, you, you can't upload it like you could an image. If you wanted to insert an image from your computer, you can't just upload it from your computer onto the slide. It has to be in your drive already. So that's just something you need to do beforehand. And when it's when you've uploaded it to your drive, a voice note that you've done on your phone or even your computer might have a voice recorder thing. You might be fancy in that way. Um, make sure that in your drive, when it's uploaded to your drive, that you have the settings to uh, everyone with the link can view. I think that's what it's called, something along those lines. But just make sure that people have access I really apologize if you can hear the banging. People are building upstairs. Whew, living in a flat. Okay. So if you want to insert an audio, you go to insert audio. So for just to demonstrate, I have some things in my drive, some voice recordings. So what was this again? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I can, this is actually something I did for a presentation I built two days ago. So I've already labeled my audio so it's easy to find. This is in my drive. And I say select. It has to be an MP3 format. So if you have an iPhone, that output format is M4A. And then you just Google like free M4A to MP3 converter online. Uh, if I remember, I can actually send you a link of one that I use. And you can just convert it there. So it's not, it's, again, it's a bit of a hassle, but it's not the end of the world. Okay, so now you've inserted your audio and it gives you this little tiny little button here at the bottom. I'm not going to get click play because you're going to hear me talking to my kids. But ultimately, if you then go through the slides as a learner, as a user or whatever, and you click on that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to play your audio. So you can give a bit of an explanation of whatever is going on in your slide or you can give instructions or whatever it might be. And now we have some options here just to make it prettier as well. I'm just going to make it a bit bigger so you can see. I like having this look like a – no, man. I like having this look a bit like a button because it feels like a little computer. So, oh, there is a bit of a drop shadow, but I want to make it a bit more uh, – what do you call it? Potent. Gaan ons recording – Ja, 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 Engela, ons gaan, Jaku gaan vir julle, uh, jy post hier, sorry, Jaku will send you an email. Um, also, I just want to get through these last few things, and then I will be available for questions as well. So those two things, please make a note of them. I will definitely try and help you uh, before the session ends, if you're keen. Um, otherwise, the recording will be sent to you via email, as far as I understand. Okay, so this audio Let's make it look like a button. So we are going to recolor it because gray for me is boring. Let's go for, ooh, let's go for that one. Nice green one. We're going to add a drop shadow. So its default setting is weird. The distance is not a lot. Blur radius. 
can adjust all of these sliders and it just makes it a bit prettier. See, now it has this look and feel of a button. I think that's pretty cool. You can add drop down shadows, by the way, to any of your elements on your slide, uh, which just makes it a bit more three dimensional. So that's how you add audio. I'm just going to quickly run through the steps again. So you're going to say insert. Remember, your audio already has to be on your Google Drive. You cannot upload it from your computer onto the slide directly. So make sure you have it on your drive and that you open up your settings to uh, anyone with the link can view or something like that. And then you say insert audio. You choose your audio from your, your drive. You go to your shred drives. You can go to drive. You can search, obviously. Let's just do another one. You're going to that one, select. So just compare this basic default one that they give you with the one that I've just sort of adjusted. I think it just looks a little bit better. And it's just a bit nicer to look at if you, if you make it look a bit more like a button because that for me is quite boring. But that's my personal taste. So let's go to the next one. Did I do all of the things here? Yes. Andrea, can I just give you Ooh. a little tip? That's Yaku here. Hello, Yaku. Sure. Hi, um, it's very weird when someone speak to me now. Sorry. Just a little, yeah. uh, a little tip in terms of the, the audio files. Um, <clears throat> it's a very useful thing just to create a Google Drive folder for yourself and that you call recording and put all your audio files in there and then you make sure that you make that, that folder that anyone with a link can view. That means any file that you put in there will automatically have the correct sharing setting. So then you don't need to worry about it at a later stage. Um, because if you share a slide with someone, that doesn't mean that that audio file is necessarily also accessible. So you just create the folder, then that you take that problem out of the equation. That is a genius idea, by the way, because I've not been doing that. So thank you. <laughs> That's a very good idea. Damn it. See, I learn something every day. Okay, so on the next slide, slides for slide five, it's called page three. It says insert a video. What is a flipped classroom presentation without a video? Now, Google, as far as I understand it, pretty much owns, well, they own YouTube. So all of the apps integrate very well uh, with one another. So YouTube, I think, is also a bit optimized in slides, so it doesn't take as much data as it would have if you just go to YouTube. So if you embed the video in your slides, instead of putting in a link, because yes, I can now go, okay, let's link this thing. You know, we can right click, we can link it, and then I can insert a YouTube URL there. But what happens, if you click on that link, then it's going to take you out of Google Slides and open up another tab. And when you're working on a mobile device, that also becomes tricky, and learners sometimes struggle to navigate that, even I struggle to navigate that. So it's it's nicer to embed your video onto the slide itself. So how do you do that? Let's just take this away. You say insert, and you go to video, and it's gonna give you an option to search YouTube. That's the default one. You know, you can go and sort of breathe and search. I'm gonna give you some options, but, oh, I got some music videos. So obviously that's not the breathe I was talking about. So this search option is not the best. The better thing to do would be to actually go onto YouTube, go and look for the video that you want, and then just paste the URL of that video here. I'll do that in a second. The other option is if you have a video on your Google Drive of something specific, you can just use your Google Drive and insert your, your video from there. I'm gonna just open up YouTube and it's probably going to be a whole bunch of golfing things. My husband is obsessed with golfing. Golfing? Golf? The thing where you hit things. Okay. Question. Oh. For major Stupid ads on YouTube. So now I have copied my URL and I've closed it because I can't cope with the YouTube ads. And I'm going to paste it in there search and it's going to give me my YouTube video that I just actually looked for. Instead of using the, the, the internal search on slides and it's gonna give you weird videos, just use YouTube directly, paste your URL, select, 
And there you have your video embedded into your slides. Oof. I'm really sorry about that, all the banging, breaking out of bathroom or something. So now we have the video and we have some options here. So let's say I don't want to show them, I don't want them to watch the whole video. Instead of typing here on the side, yeah, I can put a little text box say, start watching at one minute and 32 seconds. I can literally just adjust the video that it will start playing at one minute and 32 seconds. So you use the slider right here. You can navigate. Oof. You can use the slider and go to whatever time. So I said one minute and 30, let's say 131. And then I can say use current time and it's gonna adjust the time right there to one minute and 31 seconds. Or I can finish at the end. I want them to finish a bit earlier. So we can use the slider again. I want them to finish watching the video right there. I can say use current time. And that little box is going to update to whatever time I have I have chosen on the slider. I can also, if it's just a visual thing I want to show them, you can say mute audio. So I have some physical theater things that I want to show my kids at, at home and, and they don't necessarily have to listen to it. So you can say mute audio or whatever it is. So you do have some options to adjust your, your video um, display and how it works within your slides. This one, I want them to listen to it. And there we have a video. Now, just bear in mind that if you, if you use this option, if you insert a video oh, and you don't give them further instructions, they're not going to know how to view the video, meaning why should they watch it and what should they do with the information. So it would be a good idea just to have maybe some instructions on the side just to say, watch this video, and then you are going to complete uh, an assessment or whatever. So I'm going to just insert a, a shape because that's what I'm using for my text box. I'm just using that away. I want to change the background color. I'm just sort of recapping some of the stuff that we did. Background color is going to be pink. My border color is going to be whatever that is. I double click in the shape, I can type in there, um, watch this video and complete the Google form. Okay. I'm going to make that bigger. So now I can also add your flat icon, just make it a little bit more fun, a bit more interactive. So. Yeah, of course, they know they have to watch the video to the right of the text box, but I like using a little arrow because why not? Let's use that one. Click on it. You say, oh, so we're using a green one. Insert. Drag it. Do we want it? Now you can change your angle of the arrow. You just use, you click on that little dot here at the top and you just rotate it to wherever you want it. Doop, 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 doop. So. There you go. See, it looks a little bit better. I still think it's ugly, but I would have, I would spend much more time on this. But that's the idea. Watch this video and complete the Google form. Okay, but where's the Google form now? So I needed to get to adding assessment here on the next slide, but I'm going to add assessment right here just so you, you have an idea of how you can use this immediately. Because if I tell my learners, watch this video and complete the Google form, they're going to sit there and go, where's the Google form? We didn't know where to find it if it's on the next slide. So I'd rather just add it to this slide and then everything pertaining to that specific activity is on one slide and they cannot get confused. So what I've done is, well, I, I've already, well, my brain is going. I've already opened up an assessment that I'm going to use. So I'm going to use this thing. 
it's just an example of a Google Form quiz. If you are sort of uh, unsure about how to set up a Google Form, there are some videos on the CWD site on how to do that. It's very simple. You can set it that it marks itself. The learners get instantaneous feedback. So it's a great thing to use. Quizzes, zizzes, and Kahoot, they're also great platforms to use for something like this. But if I want to insert a Google Form, I like using the logo of that specific platform because my learners have been conditioned to recognize certain things. So they know what Kahoot looks like and what, like what they can expect from it. So if I want to use a Google Form, uh, I would go and insert an image from Google. So insert image, search the web. It's going to open up the Google image search to my right where I search for breath. And I'm just going to go for Google Form icon. And there we have some options. So this one, mm -mm, mm -mm, that's Microsoft, I think. That's the Google Form one. So you click it and it selects it by the little, selects it by the little blue tick there. Click insert. And there we have our image for the Google Form. Now we need to link this to an actual Google Form. So, with an image, remember I said with text, you can highlight it and you can right click that text to add a link to it. But with an image, you click on the image and you have to use the hyperlink thing here at the top. Little hyperlink icon right there. So <laughs> you see here at the bottom that annoying dialog box that that's cuts off here at the bottom. I don't need to find slides though. I can just go and look for my address. So. I'm going to use this Google form. I send. Oh, it's taking its sweet time. I don't know why this one is frozen now. Okay, let's try and refresh it. For some reason, it does not want me to open it. We have activity, okay. So I want the link, just a shortened URL because those long ones annoy me. And you copy the link of whatever assessment you're gonna use. Copy. And here at the bottom where I was looking to, to insert my link, just paste, apply. And now when they click on it, it's gonna take them, well, it's gonna, it's gonna move away from the slides. It's gonna go to a new browser tab. So this is something you just maybe need to facilitate in your class is just show them your yeah, everything else happens in slides. But the moment you add a digital assessment, it's going to take you out of your browser tab into a new one. So maybe just teach them how to do that and how to go back to the original slide presentation. Because after doing this Google form, after completing it, they might want to go back to slide six and just do something there as well. So now I've linked it over here. Maybe I just want an arrow pointing there as well. Otherwise, they. Oof, people are weird sometimes. They get very confused. So you need arrows everywhere. We want to flip this format options, side and rotation. We can flip it. There you go. So now they know they have to watch the video and they have to do the form afterwards. Okay, everyone's still with me and we have like five or six minutes left. I just want to show you one or two more little thingies and then I am still here. If you have any questions, if you want to talk to me, if you want to share something, please do not think that I'm finishing up in five minutes. I'm going to be hanging around, but I do want to rush through two more things. Okay, so here on the last slide, this assessment thing. So the prompt says add a QR code. Now the thing is, if you are on your phone, if you are a learner and you are on your phone, yeah, you can hyperlink a, a QR code as an image. So just what I did with the Google form thing, that is an image, I click on it, it goes somewhere. But a QR code is, you're supposed to use your phone to access a QR code. Uh, so this is something that you can maybe rather use in class. So if you have your presentation, you have it on your TV, uh, or whatever you're using, your projector, 
and there's a massive QR code that pops up. The learners can run up, you know, and crash into the screen while they scan the QR code. But if it's for a take-home content navigation thing, I don't think a QR code is the best way to go because how are they going to use their phone if they're on their phone to scan the QR code? So just just think about that before you insert it. But just so you know, QR code is very it's it's very simple to use. I, I have a very cool, it's called QR code generator. I've already bookmarked it. So what you do is open that guy up. I'm going to use the same um, assessment, by the way, just for an example. I can use a Kahoot or a Quizzes, but it's going to take time to open that. So I'm going to use the same one. And this guy, you just copy the URL in there. And right here, it's already created my unique QR code to that assessment. So I can just say copy, because that will copy it to the clipboard. I don't have to download it and this and that and whatnot. I go back to my slides and I can paste it here. And that QR code pops up. And it is as easy as that. I can also share that link for the QR code generator if you want me to. Let me just find it on my other screen. It's a nifty little thing to have. And these kids love using um, QR codes in class. They feel very cool when they do it. So that's the, there you go, the QR code generator. And then the very, very, very last thing. Okay, so this thing I've already done, insert some link from a digital assessment. If you if you do this uh, evidence of learning for the submission, for some feedback from myself, uh, you are welcome to use any assessment platform that you want to. Uh, my favorite ones are Kahoot and Quizzes and Quizlet and then Google Forms. But I know there are so many different options. So if you want to insert, some, insert something there that you found useful, please do. Because I need to expand my repertoire. <laughs> okay. And the very, very, very last thing is the website for the slides templates. Remember at the beginning I showed you these templates that are so cool. And this website has taken up so much of my time because I just keep on going back and finding new templates and then I just store them in my um, in my drive for later. I'm going to paste this link for you. So that is the Slides Mania is one of them. The other one is Slides Go. That's also a very cool one, but Slides Mania I tend to use more often. So if you open that link, this is what you'll see. Oh, and there's so much. Do you see why I mean the Google uh, templates are incredibly boring in comparison to this? I mean, how cool is that one? So you can, let's go for, oh, I like this one. So we want to use this one now. So you click on it. Oh, always gives you a little ad, just say close. And then it gives you a little preview of it as well. Let me just find it. My internet is just a bit sloppy. So you can, you can click through it and see what the other slides look like. And you go, oh man, I wanna use this, yes. You can download it for PowerPoint, whoever wants to use PowerPoint, or you can just say open in Google Slides. It's gonna open a new tab. It's gonna take you to that template and here at the top right, it says, it's gonna say something like use, yeah, use template. You just click on that and it's gonna make a copy for your personal Google Drive. There's going to be a copy in your drive. But now, just a tip, because I've done this and then I couldn't find it again. Once it's opened up in your drive, just immediately, because now it says save to drive, just immediately move it to a folder. Because I now have a folder called templates, templates and stickers or something like that. So I know where everything is when I'm looking for it. Um, it's just taking a while to load. That's the thing with these slides. They are quite big and they have a lot of slides in them. 
So they will take some time to load. Oh, man, it's taking a long time. Anyway, that little move option where you can move, there we go. That little folder with the arrow, you just move it to a easily findable folder in your personal drive and then you know where it is. So there were all my folders and you just move it there. I hope that makes sense. Now, the thing is, if I take, if I take this presentation, this template that we've used for this specific training session, and I'm going to import, I'll just show you what it does. Um, I'm going to go for theme and I'm going to import the theme now. I want to show you that it actually throws out your whole thing. A lot of the, I'm not saying every template does it, but most of the templates do it. It's incredibly frustrating. So let's use this Mac Chrome. Thank you, Slides Mania, that we've just used. Import theme. Just select the theme that you want to import. Yes, I import. Boom. And it's thinking very hard. Do you see, it doesn't look like the template at all because it's now randomly chosen one of the slides in that template and it's just put it in onto everything here. So the best thing you can do is use the template from scratch. This is your template. You're gonna do all your things. Oh, that's ugly. Okay, well, obviously these people are very extra and they changed every single letter in it. I'm not going to do that now. And my subtitle is, this is so cool. And now you can use that template as is instead of it throwing out your, your original work that you've done, because uh, trust me, it's going to be very frustrating if you do that. And that, colleagues and friends and fellow enthusiasts, uh, that's basically it for what I wanted to show you. So you are more than welcome to hang around. And um, it's unfortunate we don't have a mic option because my I'm so tired of hearing my own voice. Oh, Yaku, I don't know if you're still here and if you can unmute them. Yes, Andrew. Ah, can um, you unmute our people? You, you can also unmute them, but just uh, um, unmute them? you just right click on them and say, um, allow mic. If what? you go to the, I didn't if you go to, the you go to that, yes. Show participants, and then you just right click on any of them, and you should be, or on the more options, and it should be. Ooh. There we go. Ooh. Um, just, just one other thing, Andrea. I don't know yes. if I missed it in the beginning because I wasn't here for the whole session. Did you show them how they, the link that they're supposed to share with the learners eventually, the the preview link? Ooh, that that's need. the one thing I forgot. Yes, let me just right, unmute so this. Very Thank important you. Yes, important yes, one yes. So at the, during the theory thing, I mentioned that you can publish to the web. Um, so I'll show you that option. I just want to unmute you, mute everyone so you can speak to me whenever you want to. I don't want anyone to feel left out. So you can, un, uh, you can publish to the web and it becomes this little website. Don't know if you remember me mentioning that. Or you can add something at the back of that link that makes it a preview, which is kind of cool. I never knew you can do that. So let's go back to this example. Ooh, let's just take this template away. There you go, back to our original thing. So if you want to publish to the web, you go to file, you go to publish to the web. Let me just shut that, but it might have been too fast. So file. A bit slower, publish to the web. And now you have some options. I actually prefer to then, I don't want these slides going every three seconds because I don't know, they can't read that fast. So I just put it to the longest timer possible. So it's going to say every minute. And if you want your little website, your little presentation, just to be accessible to your specific domain, so your learners, and not necessarily the whole wide world, anyone who gets the link, you can go to publish content and settings. And here I have an option to restrict my access to Stunnebosch High School. So that's my domain. But for this exercise, I want you to be able to op open it, actually, for whatever it's worth. And I just said publish. 
and it's going to ask me, are you sure you want to publish the selection? I'm going to say, yes. I can go back and edit my Google Slides and it will update. It updates every few minutes or whatever. So it's not a direct update or immediate update, but it will, it will update. Um, I think that was the end of that sentence. I don't know why I had that inflection. So the, it gives you this link. It's a very long link. And if you copy this link, then let's just see what it looks like. I'm going to paste it into a new browser. So I close these unnecessary things. And there we go. So that was the link that I pasted. This is now published to the web. Can you see it doesn't give you all of these um, out here. It doesn't give you all of these extra little things like slideshow or share or sort of the, the behind the scenes of the slideshow. It literally just gives you what you actually want to show. So now we can still go and click through it. These navigation buttons still work. So if I click item two, it's going to go to page two. I'm going to click the index button. It's going to take me back to the index. Go to assessment. It's going to take me to that slide. And if I click on whatever else, all of these hyperlinks are still active. They still work. It's just not when the learners receive the thing, they don't have to go to slideshow and then it's only going to open up. They immediately get this very usable, very inter interactive little website that has been personalized for them. But now, Yaki actually showed me that you can do something else as well. If you want to stop publishing it to the web for whatever reason, you can literally just go and reverse your steps. So file, publish to the web, and you just say stop publishing. Stop it. Stop is going to ask you, are you sure you want to stop publishing? Yeah. So it's as simple as that, by the way. But the other thing that he showed me is if you use this link. So let's say I want to share this presentation with you, right? Click share. It's going to give me the share link. I'm going to say copy link. Let's just change that because otherwise it's just um, so anyone with link. Otherwise it's just going to be my school. I'm going to copy link. And I want to put it into the chat here. So you can see what I do. I hope you can see what I'm doing because it's quite small. I'm going to copy it, paste it right there. So here at the, oof, can you, I hope you can see what I'm doing here. After the last slash, it says edit question mark, blah, 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 blah. You delete all of that. So delete the edit question mark, USB, blah, 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 sharing, delete it. And you just type in preview. Why? Uh-uh. It's not that. No, 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 no. Ignore all of that. I did something weird. I'm going to do that. It should not be doing that. Just give me a second. I think it's because it's in the chat. There we go. Now it's an active link. There you go. And when you click on it, it should actually do the same thing, and it should open almost like a mini website, but it's without publishing it to the web. So you don't actually have to publish. It's still a little, you can either navigate using this gray bar here at the bottom, or you can use your links that you created. So on slide two, you have the blue index. Oh, well, on the index, let's go for item three. We still have the video that's going to play. We have the Google form that's going to open up in a separate browser tab. And we can still go back to the index. So that's, I think that's pretty cool. That's new info for me. Just make sure that you don't make this mistake that I made here. Your whole, can you see that my link is not, the whole thing is not active. And this one, I just had to backspace and retype it. And now I believe that is it. Thank you, Yaku, for reminding me if you can hear me. And everyone's mics should be working. If you want to say something, ask something, um, it would be nice to hear someone's voice in the void. No one? Okay. I will be hanging around anyway for a few more minutes. Uh, the training session is officially done. 
Yaka will be sending out emails for you regarding the submission of the evidence of learning. Please remember to fill out this register, the, 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 what do you call it, the uh, attendance register. I'm just going to copy it and paste it again so you have it. Before you leave, just quickly fill that out. Please, please, please. And yeah, I'm sure he'll send a recording as well. If you have any questions for me, I will be hanging around um, for a few more minutes and I'm here to help. Absolute pleasure, Alan. Always worried that I'm going.